In this demonstration, we are going to go ahead and install Vpod and show you how to get that done. However, it would not make any sense if I just went and clicked a bunch of stuff and installed Vpod. So I'm going to take just a little bit of time to do a quick refresher on the theory of Vpod. So I won't spend too much time on this, but let's go through this anyway. So we have a suite called the ACI Anywhere, and ACI Anywhere basically is a marketing term that means that ACI can go anywhere. So there is no product called ACI Anywhere as such. It encompasses everything that ACI can do. To start off with, let's look at the middle. Over there, we have the single part, and then we had the multi part and the multi site that came in. Now those are all on-premise fabrics. Now if you wanted to extend your ACI fabric to a remote location, be it on the private side or the public side, then you can do that too. So on the left hand side, you are going to see that the remote locations are different, uh, different places that this ACI fabric has been extended to. Now, there are two different items on the, pub, on the private cloud that you can extend your ACI to. One is the remote leaf, and the other one is the virtual pod. And then on the public side, you can extend it to the cloud. For instance, AWS and Azure, which are there now, and GKE and IBM Cloud and more are coming. So what exactly is virtual pod? Virtual pod is basically a way of extending ACI fabric through an IP cloud and having a virtual pod on the other side. Now keep in mind that this is virtual, meaning that on the other side, you don't actually have real spines and real leaves. The virtual pod is a new pod that's set up in the existing fabric and that virtual pod would have these components of control plane, which is going to be your V-leaf and V-spine. And then for the data plane, we use the AVE. So this means that you would have to have bare metals on the other side, on which you are going to have your hypervisor, ESXi hypervisor. And on top of that, you're going to be installing your virtual pod. The control plane components of virtual pod on the V-spines and the V-leaf. And as you can see in this diagram, a BGP EVPN session is, is established all the way from the physical spine, physical location spine to the virtual pod spine. And the data plane component is the AVE or the ACI virtual edge. Once you've configured virtual pod, you can configure all the policies from a single plane of glass from the APIC and the virtual pod would just look like one more pod in the fabric. That's one thing that I wanted to point out here is that the virtual pod is actually a pod in the fabric. Let's take a quick look over here. If you notice in this topology over here, I have uh, three pods, pod one, pod two, and pod five. And pod five, if you notice, uh, is a virtual pod. So it has two virtual leaves and two virtual spines and two AVEs. If you come to pod five and you look over here, these are all virtual. So it is in fact a pod in the same fabric. It's still one fabric. Contrast that to remote leaf. In remote leaf, in this particular fabric, we have remote leaf configured. And if you look at the topology, the remote leaves, two remote leaves, they are part of the same pod in the fabric. So if I go over here to pod one, you are going to see that remote leaf 120 and 121 are in fact inside pod one. There is not a separate pod for remote leaf. Now, when you install remote leaf initially, you have to choose what pod it goes in. 
Now there is one more item that I just wanted to point out over here for remote leaf is that when you go to system uh, and system settings uh, in the newest release which is 4.2.3 as you can see over here 4.2.3i you can actually go and say remote leaf pod redundancy policy and there is an option here if that pod has a problem then the remote leaf would move to a different pod so if you had more than one pod and you were doing remote leaf and you put your remote leaves on pod 1 you could actually enable this option and if pod 1 had an issue the remote leaves would automatically move to pod 2 Going back to virtual pod, the virtual pod components are the vSpine, the vLeaf, and the AVE. vSpine and vLeaf are the control plane, and the AVE is the data plane. The data, the data never goes to the leaf or the spine in the case of vPod. It goes directly from the AVE to the destination. As you can see, the ACI fabric has been extended to a remote location through an IP network. On the remote location, there would be a couple of routers or switches that would then be connected to a couple of ESXi hypervisors. Those ESXi hypervisors would have a VDS switch manually installed on which would reside the VLeaf and the vSpines. So this these two hypervisors would be serving for the control plane component of VPod. The data plane components would be served by other hypervisors where you would connect your VMs to. On those hypervisors, you would install a cloud AVE. Of course, in a lab situation, you can get away by using just two hypervisors and combine the control plane and the data plane components together. That is exactly what we are going to do in the install that we'll show you right now. Before we move on to the actual lab install, let's quickly talk about the addressing so we are all on the same page. So on the right-hand side is our physical fabric, and on the left-hand side will be the VCOD fabric. Now, on the physical fabric, we have two pods, and since we have two pods, while doing the install for the two pods in a multi-pod situation, each pod would have its own internal tap pool. So that's what it's showing over there, 10100-16, and on the bottom it's 10300-16. The next thing is the external tap pool. So this is used by multi-pod, by the v, v pod and it's used so that you can translate the IP addresses and carry that prefix on through a public network. So most people have used RFC 1918 for the tech tools, so those cannot go over a public network. And as you can see, you might have to bring your c connection from the VPod to the physical pod through a public network, in which case you would have to route public networks. In any case, uh, you have to do this whether you have uh, routable networks in your internal tech pool or not, but chances are that you don't since most people have put uh, internal tech pools as private networks. The next component is the CP uh, CP cap, and these are actually the loopbacks uh, which are used for your BGP peering, your EVPN peering. Then you have your data plane cap, and if you notice, these are any cast addresses. And the data plane cap is basically the next hop for the data plane. That's where the packet's going to come to from the other side. BGP is going to put user out map to set the next hop to that data plane tab. As you notice, the data plane tab is unique per pod. And then the border leaf, if you have any, would have also a border, border leaf external tab. And that again would come from the 
from the external tech pool that you would have supplied to do record. And just incidentally, I forgot to mention that the data plane tech is also an external, uh, it also comes from the external range, and that's why it's called data plane e -tech. And last but not least is the multicast tag, which is basically an anycast address, and it's used for head end replication destination from the VPOD to the to the physical fabric. If you notice, the entire uh, fabric, the physical fabric, has one multicast tag. And then on the VPOD side, you would have to put a tag pool and the control plane uh, tabs and the tabs for the AVE, and, uh, which is the HREP tab, and the regular uh, tab for the, uh, for the AVE. I do want to point out, though, that although this looks quite involved, if you use the wizard and configure your virtual pod, it will guide you through all this. As long as you do your initial design with the IP addresses and everything, it will guide you through it. So it's actually not as bad as it looks. Few more items before we actually jump on the lab and configure it, is that uh, the uh, V-spines and the V-leaves are route reflector, the V-spine is the route reflector server and the VLeaf is the route reflector client. And then you have BGP VXLAN EVPN from the VSpine to the physical spine. And then uh, the VSpine also happens to be the group Oracle and the AVEs are the group citizens. The Offlex protocol runs between the VLeaf and the AVE. And the AVE is the client for the uh, for, for the Offlex proxy, which runs on the VLeaf. From a requirements perspective, on the physical pod, you can, you can see over here, basically you need Gen 2 spines, whether it be the fixed ones or the modular ones. And then for your virtual machines, you need ESXi 6.0 or higher, and you need basically two vCPUs and 8 gigs of RAM and 80 gigs of storage for your VLeaves and vSpines for each of them. And the AVE requires two vCPUs, 4 gig RAM, and 24 gigabyte of storage. The round trip timer between your physical pod and the virtual pod should be 150 milliseconds or less. And the data plane component, uh, uh, the data for the data plane, you also need uh, to increase, the, increase your MTU by 50 bytes because the packets are all, the data plane packets are all enca encapsulated in, in VXLAN. Couple more slides to talk about. This is the scale as of 423. It's always important to look at the scale. Again, this scale is basically the validated scale. You could probably go higher than this. It's just not validated. And if this, uh, if your deployment needs more than this, just call Cisco, get with your uh, rep at Cisco, and we can work at that, at validating bigger numbers. The other thing to be aware of is that uh, this is some of the stuff that you need to know before putting it in production that virtual pod is not supported when combined with multi-site or remote leaf. So you cannot have multi-site and remote leaf while doing virtual pod at the same time. Virtual pod does not support IPv6. AVE cloud mode VPOD AVE does not support attribute-based segmentation, shared services, QoS marking, NetFlow, and first of security. And direct entry out from the virtual pod is now supported with the 423 release using entry out with Golf. All right, now that we have the basics of VPOD squared away, let's jump on and show how to exactly configure this. So what I've done is made a diagram, which is always the first step, listed out all the IP addressing that I would like, and listed out the connections and all the 
we, uh, all the care packages, foods, and everything else. Notice that I am actually using a multipod, and uh, the these two pods over these two uh, spines over here, uh, spine two hundred four and spine two hundred three, are connected to IPN one, and they are from pod one. And on pod two, I have spine four hundred three and four hundred five connected to IPN two. And then uh, I have listed out all my tap pools over here. Since I was already running multipod, I really need very few things extra. I already had most of these because of multipod. So what I need extra over here is basically the external tap pool. And that's going to be used for the address translation. Also notice that I have only two ESXIs in the lab, so I'm going to be using the control plane and the data plane in the same ESX size, like we've spoken previously. Of course, this would not be recommended in a production environment. You should have your control plane on a separate pair of ESX size. One more quick note I would like to make over here is that it just happens that this multipod physical fabric is also part of a multi-site setup. So there are two more sites which are actually set up in, in a multi-site fashion with this particular site. Now, although I've said that VPod is not supported when you do multi-site, uh, you can do this in a lab and it will work, but you cannot, it's not supported in production, of course, and also from the multi-site orchestrator, you will not be able to configure anything for the VPod. So you should not be really doing this, but in this particular case, I did not want to break down my multi-site configuration, so I just went and did it. But again, this is not to be done in production. The next thing we need to do is to configure the IPN router for the proper connectivity to the hypervisors for the control plane and the data plane. So if you look at this diagram over here, my control plane links are, I have one link from each, uh, each IPN for the control plane. Those are the dark red ones. And then the cross links are the data plane. Also notice that I have over here VLAN 3967 going through this trunk port between the two IPNs. And I have put a SVI on IPN1 and an SVI on IPN2 for VLAN 3967. Now, uh, just to make sure it's clear, I just happened to choose VLAN 3967. This has absolutely no bearing on the infra tap, on the infra VLAN for the physical pod in any way. This is just an arbitrary VLAN that I've chosen in this particular case. It doesn't have any connection to the physical uh, fabric VLAN. So now I, this is the configuration for the, uh, for the VLANs, for the SVIs. Basically, I went ahead and put these IP addresses and I put them in OSPF. And again, I want to make sure that uh, my MTU is large enough to carry my data plane traffic and adding 50 bytes. Of course, you know, 9150 would be the ideal choice. And I put it in the same VRF that my multi, uh, my multi pod uh, fabric is connected to on the IPN side. So it's the VRF basically that's uh, connecting the multi pods together. And in this particular case, the uh, multi sites also, but that's really not relevant. And uh, also I've put OSPF over here and I've turned on HSRP. So uh, basically my, uh, my default gateway from the VPOD would be the HSRP address, as you see. It's 10.11.3.254. Then on IPN1, if you notice, I have Ethernet 118, which is the control plane. And on the control plane, all I've done is I've put it in uh, switch board mode trunk. And I've allowed that VLAN 3967 to go in to the ESX side. Similarly, I've done the same thing on the other side. And uh, VLAN uh, 118 happens to be the data plane.
from the other IPM to, to ESXi1. Configuration is pretty much the same. And then on Ethernet 119, uh, from IPN1, uh, I have the data plane component over there. And uh, similarly, on Ethernet 119, on IPN2, I have the control plane component. Now, one thing on the data plane component that I do want to point out is that if you notice, I also have configured VLAN 3967 to be the native VLAN. So if you look at the data plane configuration for IPN2, uh, for IPN I've done the same thing. The rationale behind that is that the uh, AVE that you will connect up to the data plane does not, by default, have a uh, VLAN encapsulation on the, uh, on the uplink side. It, it just does it in the default uh, uh, unencapsulated VLAN, so you basically need to make sure that the packets coming from there are actually going into your configured VLAN on the IPN. Of course, you could change that on the AVE side, uh, but that would require you to go ahead and make that uplink interface on the AVE side into a uh, into a dot into a dot one Q uh, port with VLAN 3967. Uh, in this case, I did not want to do that. I just wanted to keep it default, and that is the reason why I have to use switchboard trunk native VLAN 3967 on the data plane configuration on, on this side. And one more item that I just noticed is that I have put IP games fast mode in the SVI. That is really not necessary. Uh, I probably just did that by habit. Uh, because VPOD does not require uh, multicast in the network. Uh, just like multi-site or remote leaf, we now don't need that. Only multipod requires multicast, uh, binder, pin binder multicast. Uh, none of the other technologies that we have require multicast in the IPN, on the IPN side because we use head-end replication. And that was the whole reason for having the multicast uh, head and replication anycast address. So here is the logical topology that always helps while doing the configuration. So I have the two ESX sides, which I'm running the control plane and the data plane in because it's a, it's a lab and I can get away with it. And I have VLAN 2967 which has which is going to be my default gateway and i'm going to bring up a manual dvs on which i'm going to configure the uh, the uh, vpod uh, port group and connect up my vleaf and response and then later on i'm going to go and install uh, the AVE DVS. actually that's going to be part of the wizard which will do it for you and then we are going to actually connect up our AVEs to that, and these are the VM NICs that I'm going to that I'm going to uh, hook up to the data plane and the control plane components, so they are in the right place. Also, notice that this VLAN 3967 needs to be uh, routable all the way to the physical spines, and that's possible because I have put OSPF in there. When the VLEFs and VSpines boot up, they are going to Send out, send out DHCP, uh, DHCP request, and uh, the SVI over here will get it. And we are going to then configure a DHCP relay to go and relay that to the APIC. So the APIC will be the DHCP server, and the APIC will reply back with the IP addresses. And then uh, they are both going to get the required IPs, and they're going to boot up. Uh, of course, we did not put the HSRP, uh, the DHCP forwarding addresses yet because we don't know what they are going to be at this point in time. So uh, you might be tempted to think, but we do know uh, because it's the APIX IP address and we do know what the APIX IP ad internal IP address is, but that's really not uh, what we are talking about here because remember in the VPOD case, we use the external tap pool 
And from the external cap pool, there's going to be a NAT IP configure, which is going to be the destination. And that NAT IP will map to the APIC internal IP. So we would have to actually put the NAT IP over here as the forwarding address for the BHCP relay. So now I went into vCenter and I basically configured this uh, new DVS switch on both the hosts, uh, which is 10, 29, 190, 23, and 24. And as you noticed, I have uh, connected up VMNIC3 to uh, the uplink for the control plane. Uh, and there you're going to see that VMNIC3 on both of these are for the control plane. So I've hooked up VMNIC3 for the control plane. And I've also made a port group on it called port group vport control. The next thing you'll notice is that I make one more port group called DVS parking. Now, this is sort of a trick. It's a temporary port group. And uh, remember on the uh, V-Leaf and V-Spine, you have the control plane uh, link that goes up. And then you also have the management uh, link to, to SSH into the VPOD or the VLEAF, just like you would do on a regular LEAF or SPINE. And that needs to be connected to your out-of-band network generally, which is, the, which is in my case coming from a vSwitch. The out-of-band is in a separate vSwitch that connects, uh, the, and that NIC connects to the, uh, the out-of-band management switches. Now, uh, one of the things is that if I had connected the management, uh, the management NIC of the vSpine and vLeaf to the vSwitch and the control plane on the DVS control plane uplink, uh, the uh, installation would actually fail. It requires you to have both those links on the same switch. So uh, for that reason, what I am going to do is I'm going to actually put the management links on this temporary DVS parking uh, port group. Uh, and uh, also, I want, uh, I, I want them to get IP addresses because uh, I don't want to go and have to configure the IP addresses on them uh, for the out of band management. Uh, again, later on, you would. Uh, have to, uh, you would want to go to management tenant and put the IP address anyway, but I wanted those IP addresses to come in right away so I can SSH into them and look around. So what I've done is on uh, the DVS parking port group, if you notice I went to configure and I basically gave it a uh, DHCP pool and when, the, when they come up, when they boot up, they're actually going to get IP addresses from uh, from the IP pool that's configured in vCenter on that board group. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but this is a pretty neat trick to uh, give out IP addresses, almost like a DHCP uh, range to, uh, to any, uh, any host that you're bringing up. Now notice that uh, I have uh, used uh, 10.29.198.105, which is my out-of-band uh, management IP subnet, and I've put uh, pound four, meaning that I want four addresses, so five, one of five, one of six, seven, eight. And that's because I have two V-leaves and two V-spines. And of course, I've put my DNS server and my gateway IP over there, so it automatically configures all that, and I don't have to mess with it later on. So the next thing I need to do, of course, is to download the images. So if you go on CCO, you're going to see that there are two images for the VPOD. Now the VPOD image is the same for the leaf and the spine. Just like even in ACI, you have the same image for leaf and spine. Now uh, I target whatever image I'm going to download, but now the thing is, do I download the OVA or the ISO? So when you install for the first time, you need the OVA because you have to bring up the V-Leaf and the V-Spine. Subsequently, when you upgrade your fabric and you need to go to a new release, at that time, you can just do your upgrade using the ISO file, just like the regular leaf and regular spine. The OVA would not be necessary anymore. 
So initially, I would just go and uh, go and download the OBA file, and of course, uh, I need to get the uh, uh, I need to extract the OVA and get the OVF and the VMDK from inside that OVA. Uh, so uh, that, of course, uh, you could easily do by extracting it. If you're using a Mac, just rename the OVA to a .tar and then extract it, and you're going to get the OVF and the tar file and the uh, and the uh, VMDK file from inside it. So this slide just shows you that if you were going to upgrade later on, you just choose repo during the upgrade and take the ISO file and upgrade just like you do for a normal leaf or a normal spine. Now, uh, you have to also, of course, download the AVE image. And then you need to go to the vCenter control, to the vCenter uh, template, the uh, content library and uh, download those OVFs into the content library so you can use them. The next thing to do is that you need to go to the Cisco ACI plugin. Now, uh, we are assuming that uh, you have already installed the plugin. If you have not, you can download the plugin from CCO and install it. Uh, to install it, you can use either uh, Python uh, which is, uh, you can install Python on uh, Linux box or even on your Mac or whatever, and, and there are certain requirements, and you you have to uh, actually modify your YAML file with some information and then push it to vCenter and it will install it, and then this new, uh, new uh, uh, icon will show up for the Cisco ACI fabric. And then once it comes up, you click on it, and you can register your APIX to it, and now uh, you can do quite a few things from vCenter on your APIX. But for vPod, uh, this is actually not optional. You do need to use this. Now, uh, you could also do the install from PowerCLI. Uh, it's up to you, whatever you prefer. In my view, uh, you know, using Python uh, is quite simple, but if you prefer to use PowerCLI, go for it. And here is where I'm showing that uh, the uh, three APICs for that particular physical fabric or for that fabric has been registered and it shows that. And then the next thing I do is I go and click on infrastructure. So mind you now I'm inside that plugin for ECI on vCenter. And I then click on vPod and it basically says, I don't know anything about vPod. Uh, similarly, if I clicked on AVE, it would say the same thing. And that's because we haven't done the initial config on the uh, APIC yet to tell it that there should be vPods present. Now that I've done my basic configuration on the IPN and also on vCenter and connected up the uplinks for the control plane, now we need to go to the APIC and start installing. So the first thing is that I go to Fabric inventory and I look at the topology as is, as mentioned earlier I see that I have two parts because this is a multi-part setup so now uh, the next thing you want to do is that you want to go to your infra tenant since this is already a multi-part setup and you need to go to your L3 out for the multi-part the one that connects to the spine for multi-part and you need to make sure that you have this external control peering checked. It should be there by itself, but in case it's not, this is an area that you will need to check because if this is not checked, then on the wizard, uh, you are going to be missing steps and it's not going to work. So this is something that you need to make sure that you do. Again, I point out over here that multi-site uh, uh, multi and remote leaf are not supported. Uh, this fabric is part of a multi-site. Uh, remote leaf and virtual pod on the same fabric will not work at all, but with multi-site it will work, but you are not supposed to do it because it's not supported, and remember that uh, any configuration on the vPod will have to be done from the APIC. MSO will not be able to see that vPod. Next thing to do is to go to fabric inventory and go to quick start and go to add pod. 
and then you will be able to see that you have the options of adding a part and adding a virtual part. Obviously, we'll click on adding a virtual part, and you are going to get some information that you should read, and then you have to click on get started over here. Once you click on get started, then the next step would be that you would have your uh, this uh, this page show up, and you would have to give it the external tap IP. Uh, the other things will generally be picked up automatically, and since we already have multipod running, it's going to pick it up automatically. But uh, these uh, these IP addresses are the external tap pool that I have configured. That was in the diagram that I put in over here. And just to double check, we see over here that on pod one, our external tech pool that we had uh, we had uh, config or we said we were configure was 10500 slash 24, and then on the other side the external tech pool was 10510 slash 24, and the other IP addresses are over here that it already picked up by itself. Once you hit the next button, the next screen will show up, and you're going to put your pod ID in there, and the pod tap pool, and again, uh, the pod tap pool is what we had decided uh, what we would put in. So this is the tap pool for the vpod itself, and remember the gateway would be 10.11.3.254, uh, which is the HSRP address of the, uh, of the uh, IPN uh, VLAN 3967. So if you notice, I put that in. And from that slash 22, I'm reserving few addresses slash 29. So I've taken a range of slash 29 uh, out of 3, uh, 3 to 48 slash 29. Uh, and uh, I'm going to reserve that for the infrastructure address itself. So if you notice, 3 to 54 falls in this range also. So 11.0 slash 22 will give you 11, 0, 1, 2, 3. So I've taken the very last one, and I've reserved a few addresses from there for the all the infra, infra addresses on the uh, vpod side. So those are not given out by uh, default to, uh, any, to anyone asking for the HCP addresses. Then on the right-hand side, I put my vleaf and uh, vspine uh, ID the uh, leaf ID and the spine IDs, and I put the router IDs uh, from uh, that I had decided that I would put from the diagram. And then uh, on BGP side, I say use defaults. Uh, if I didn't say use defaults, it would just give me the option of selecting MD5 encryption for the theory, and uh, I don't have any kind of encryption, so uh, I haven't. I haven't bothered to do that. The next item the wizard will guide you through is to create the DVS for the AVE. And here is the screen. And uh, we've named the DVS vpod AVE. We've given it an internal VLAN range of 1 through 199. Those are for the uh, ports inside the primary and the secondary ports, and then the vCenter information, and the data center in vCenter, and the vCenter username and password, the multicast address, and the pool of multicast address, which is one per EPG. So you'd need enough over there, and then the DVS version. Once you hit the next button, then it's going to come and give you the information of all the policies, the node profiles, node selectors, interface selectors, and everything else that it's going to configure through the wizard uh, onto the fabric. Of course, once it's done, you might want to just go and do some spot checks and clean up if you have any particular way uh, of doing it. For instance, I like to make my uh, leaves uh, my leaf interface profile is done in a very organized fashion, so I just fix it. But that's totally up to you. Uh, the point is that it does all that for you. You can even come here and change the names, and then you say finish. 
and then once you say finish, it's going to actually give you this information. Uh, you can read through it, but the most important thing here is the APIC uh, passphrase. Uh, and this is going to be required to register the VLEAVES and the VSPINES when you actually install, uh, install the uh, OS from vCenter. And then it's going to give you these uh, IP addresses. And notice that these are coming from the CLAN5 range. So these are basically uh, the addresses on the spine that are natted uh, to the APIC. Now, if you SSH to your spines, to any of the spines, and you do a show NAT, you're going to see those IP addresses that showed up from there also. And you're going to see that they are actually natted to the, the three, there's three IP addresses that they are natted to APIC1, APIC2, and APIC3. Uh, also, if you go to Fabric, Fabric Setup Policies, and you go to Virtual Power, you're going to see that tap pool that you have put in there is uh, automatically put in there for you. And the gate city servers are the uh, are, are 501 and 502, which happen to be the leaves. Now, what this is saying is that the leaves are gate city servers. Now, we all know that the, that the APIC is the DHCP server for the leaves and the spines, but uh, bear in mind that when we, AD, when we install the ADE, cloud ADE later on, when they boot up, they are going to get their IP addresses from the leaves, because the leaves will be the DHCP server for them. You can also go to uh, Fabric, uh, to inventory and then to Power Fabric Setup Policy and click on the tech pool. Uh, in this case, as you can see, I've clicked on the tech pool for pod, uh, for the first part, part one. And in there, you're going to see that externally tech pool is associated, 10500 is associated with that tech, with that primary tech pool. Uh, and that's where your NAT addresses and your external uh, addresses which are routable are coming in. Now, if you went and clicked on uh, part two, you're going to see that part two step pool will be, of course, different. And the external tap pool on part two will be coming from 10.5.1.0 slash 24. Now, if you go to fabric inventory and you click on fabric membership, you're going to see that your V part. Uh, components, the control pen components have all come in over there. Uh, and of course, they are in node spending registration, not in the registered nodes. And they are all undiscovered at this point in time. So uh, now you need to go back to your IP. And on VLAN 2967, you add the IP DHCP relay. So when, when we install the uh, VLEAF and VSPINE OS on them, and you bring it up and it sends a DHCP request out, it will come to this uh, to this router uh, and on this interface, and then it's going to get relayed to this these IP addresses, which happen to be the NATs for the APIX, and the APIX will then give it out the IP address. So now we go back to vCenter, we go to infrastructure, and now it automatically shows part five over there. Remember before it showed nothing over there. Uh, so now vCenter knows about it. And now, uh, now that it knows about it, we can actually go and start installing the software on it. So we basically uh, choose both the hosts, and we select the software. And the software, remember, was already pushed into the content library. So it's getting it from there. And we give it uh, for management, the DBS parking. Remember the temporary uh, port that I had created to put the management port in? I put that in, and for the uplinks, the actual infra, I put the actual control plane. This is the permanent one that will be there. And for the APIC passphrase, I put the passphrase in there. Now, remember that the passphrase, uh, we got the passphrase quite a while ago, while uh, when we finished configuring uh, the visor. But now, by this time, the passphrase has prob probably expired so you need to go back and get it somehow. So uh, to get it, it's very simple. Uh, you go to System, System Settings, APIC Passphrase, and it's going to be there. 
and it's going to show you how long it's uh, good for. So it rotates every uh, 60, 60 minutes. So if you catch it when it's just about to expire, maybe one minute left, you might just want to wait uh, till it uh, finishes that cycle and comes back. But if you have more than five, uh, uh, five to six minutes left, you should be good. But it's but you can make your decision if you want to wait till the next cycle or not. Uh, but it's real simple. You just copy it from here and you paste it in there. And then once you st once you say install, it this will take a while now depending on. Uh, how fast uh, it can get it from the content library. If the, if the backing for the content library was like a remote NFS mounted server and depending on your speed, it might take a little bit longer, but you can just take a coffee break over here and come back. And uh, once, it's come ba once you come back, then, uh, then oh, uh, at this time, I'm showing it's active, so at this time, Coffee break is over, and they've actually installed it. Uh, and if you notice, uh, it got all the management IPs, 5678, uh, and it got it based on who came up first, uh, because that was that DBS parking, uh, the uh, DHCP pool from there. And these host IPs uh, also came in. These actually came in directly. We didn't configure them. This also came in from DHCP. Uh, DHCP. So now, we uh, go to the next step, and that is basically we uh, want to take everything out of DVS parking and put it on the on my on my uh, VM switch VM network, which is my out of band. In your case, it might be different, so you'll have to do it accordingly. But I just go to VMware uh, and use the VMware wizard and say move everything from DVS parking to VM network. So all the four. Uh, a mix, uh, VMix from those VLeaf and VSpines, they move over, and now I have external connectivity. And if you notice over here, uh, I can ping those guys, and now they are up and running. So now, if you come to vCenter hosting clusters, you're going to see that I have uh, the VLeafs and the VSpines installed, uh, installed, and they're up and running. If I go to uh, APIC now, I click on port 5, you can see that it shows a nice uh, diagram over here saying that uh, this is my IP network. And basically, uh, I have VLeaps and VSpines connected to it. And you can see right here that all my VLeaps and VSpines are there. And if I go to topology and look at it, now I see that the new VPod, uh, port 5, which I configured, has just shown up. Now notice that I have two V spines, two V leaves, but I don't have the AVEs, which is the required component for the data plane. So that part I have still not done, so I need to do that now. The next thing that we need to do is get the IP addresses of the V leaf and V spine, the internal addresses. Remember, we had said that the internal cap range would be from 1011. So it put, put that in there. But we need to actually obtain that for the leaves. So if you look over here, the leaves are 1011, 3241, and 3242. And sorry, 3241 3, and 3240. And I've mentioned that over here. And the reason I need that is because when I install the AVE, the AVE will actually use those IP addresses as their DHCP servers. So then, I go and I add those DHCP relay addresses on VLAN 3967. And the reason I do that is because when these AVEs boot, they are going to actually send the DHCP request. The DHCP request will go to the SVI. The SVI is then going to forward them to the IP address of the relief. And then the relief, which is the DHCP server for the AVE, will actually hand out the IP to the AVE. So now I go back to my vCenter, and the wizard that we ran from APIC had already installed the vPod AVE. Uh, it had asked us what, uh, if we wanted to get that installed, and we said yes, and we gave it this name. So it installed it, and this is the basic structure of the uh, AVE. 
uh, notice that uh, this is the same code as the regular AVE, but uh, because it's done on VPOP, it does its configuration is a little different, and the port groups look a little bit different. For instance, it has this uh, outside cloud, and that's the reason why it's called the cloud AVE. Uh, and uh, remember that this also does VXLAN all the way to the AVE. So the AVEs are actually like uh, real leaves, and it's running Coop on the AVE itself. In any case, I go ahead and connect up my AVE uplinks uh, over here, and uh, VMNIC2, uh, I uh, connect them up. Uh, so if you see it's assigned over here, then I say next, and it will go and assign them. And then uh, I'm going to connect the uh, AVE, uh, the management port again to my uh, to my uh, vSwitch. In this particular case, I can just go to the v, uh, to the VM network on the vSwitch because that's where my uh, out of band is connected. And I give it a DHCP range. I go to configure IPv4 because my management side doesn't have DHCP, so I just do this over here again and I say give two addresses because I just have two hosts so that's all I need so I put that in there and then uh, I uh, go back to the uh, ACI fabric plugin to infrastructure and this time I go to AVE and I choose the code which is which was already downloaded into uh, the content library and I choose uh, the management code group this time to VM network and the data store it's advisable here to click edit and choose local data store. Its performance is much better. And you put in some password that you want for the VM admin. And this is very important. You need to make sure that you click the VPod mode. If you did not do this, then it would not be a cloud AVE. It would be a regular AVE. And of course, we are going to install that on port 5. And these are the two hosts on port 5. Then I go ahead and say install upgrade ACI virtual edge. And after a coffee break, that should be done. And now you're going to see that they both come in online. And as you notice, they have their management IPs also obtained from that IP pool, which I had given it. Both hosts, now if you uh, go and look at the hosting clusters, uh, you're going to see that both hosts, uh, by the way, you're going to notice a red mark here, and that's because this host has some issue with power with one of the power supplies, but regardless, uh, we won't dwell on that. Uh, and then the AVEs are now up and running. So now you have, uh, you had uh, relief and respine before, and now you also have an AVE on it. And uh, ignore this, this because I took the capture later, I basically went and put a VM over there to do some testing. So uh, just to show you, the AVE uh, DVS port, the main DVS port for AVE, there are two main uh, ports that are used. Uh, one is the outside cloud and one is the inside cloud. And if you click on outside cloud and click on VM, you're going to see those, those are being used by AVE. And similarly on the inside, you're going to see that those are being used by the AVE. So now if you go back to topology view, you're going to see that it shows that two AVEs are also online and the entire VPOP should now be working. Now, if you SSH to your vSpine and you look at it, if you do, do a IPA or IP address show, you're going to see that Ethernet 5.1 is actually the uplink that connects to the spine. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because in my case, uh, I had a slight issue where the wizard had put 1.1 one, one over here instead of 5.1, which made uh, the connection not work. So I spotted that and I went to the uh, interface profile on the spine and I changed that and then everything started working. This never happened to me in the earlier release but in the in 423 I noticed this happened to me a couple of times so I'm pointing this out. Now uh, if you check on the interfaces of the outside cloud and you uh, and you go and you look uh, SSH to the AVE, this KNI0 uh, is uh, the IP address of it is 1011. It got it from that cap pool for, that we had specified and that went to the outside cloud. So that's where the outside cloud is the one that basically connects to your uplink. 
and uh, you can also uh, go. Uh, you should also go and verify uh, your BGP rot reflector in uh, APIC in system system settings, and verify that your vSpines are actually configured for rot reflectors, which it should have done automatically. But this is just a little check. Uh, then, uh, if you wanted to check, you build a tenant. Uh, and basically, in my case, I built a tenant called SM Tenant One. I make two BDs, and I put some EPGs over here on the on the virtual part. So EPG one and EPG two are on the virtual part, and EPG three is on the physical part. And uh, uh, and basically, then I ping from uh, 62, 6200, which happens to be this one, and I uh, uh, sorry, I ping. Uh, from uh, from V pageant, I ping. Uh, okay, so I'm pinging from here. I'm pinging from here, and I'm pinging 62, 6200, and uh, obviously between the V pod, two VMs between the V pod are working fine. And I also ping something which is on the uh, other side, on the other pod, and that works too. And of course, uh, I'm just showing over here that I had to put contracts in between the ZPGs. So just regular ACI stuff, nothing groundbreaking over there. Uh, these are some commands that you might want to actually look and see. Uh, so on the uh, virtual spines, you can do show BGP, I2, VPN, EVPN, sum uh, for that VRF. And you can see that the neighbor relationships have formed to the uh, physical part. Uh, you can also look at uh, prefixes, for instance, uh, my VMs were on the 62, uh, 62 uh, prefix, so I just did a grab for it, uh, and uh, basically uh, I can see them in the EVPN table. Uh, the next thing I want to point out is that on the AV, there are a lot of nice commands you can do. Uh, for instance, when command show port, uh, when command show flex cloud, you could also use this for troubleshooting. Uh, any contracts that you put in go directly into the AVE. Remember, the AVE is now like a leaf, so it gets programmed into the AVE. You can actually go see the contracts over there, and you can see your L3 table. And uh, and uh, th these commands should be very very helpful uh, in case you have problems, or even if you just want to learn and look around. Here's one more thing you can do. Some customers prefer to have their DVS DVS switch stretched across the physical part and the virtual part, just like you would in a multi-part situation. You might want to have your same DVS stretched across all the ESXi hosts in uh, all the parts. Now, if you wanted to do that, you could, instead of putting the uh, ESX size in a separate vCenter data center like we did in our demonstration, you could have put those ESX size in the same physical fabric. And then when you installed the AVE from the wizard, you could have installed it on all the hosts. And now you could have a stretch base AVE DVS and then later on, when you install the AVE Cloud, you install that only on the vPod side, the ESX size on the vPod side. And on the regular side, on the physical side, you install the AVE without the Cloud option check. So now you're going to have one DVS stretched across your physical fabric and your vPod. And these are some references uh, to VPOD that you can find on CCO. And with that, I'm pretty much done. So thank you for listening.